Welcome, everyone. We have a very special evening planned. We were very fortunate that Swami Sarva Priyanandaji uh, was, was able to come. He was invited, most of you know, for a conference on Dharma that takes place tomorrow night. So we grabbed him and asked could he come early and, and share a little of his uh, time with us uh, tonight. So he was very gracious to do that. Many of you saw him when he was here earlier, about two years ago? Two years ago, you were visiting at that time? So since that time, he came back again and, and was assistant uh, at the Vedanta Society of Southern California. And very recently, uh, he's been transferred to be the head of the West Side Center, the Vedanta Society of New York. So we're very happy that Swamiji could come. He'll be here uh, Today, tomorrow night, is the program. If anyone is interested, uh, it takes place between 6 and 8 o'clock at the Johns Hopkins University Interfaith Center, and, and we should have some more flyers still out there. There's uh, an online registration also, so they know how many people are coming. So Swamiji will be speaking tonight on self-inquiry, and then after that, we invite everyone to come and join us for Prasad in the Basement. O Masato Ma Sadgamaya, Tamaso Ma Jyotir Gamaya, Mrityur Ma Amritam Gamaya, O Shanti Shanti Shanti. My pranams to revered Maharaj, uh, other revered monks here, and dear devotees, good evening. It's a pleasure to be back here again after two years, and suddenly this opportunity has come to speak with you. So I chose the subject self-inquiry. You see, the context is the human condition itself. We are all haunted by a dream of perfection. Perfect happiness, peace, joy, overcoming suffering. We feel it should be possible. And this is what we are haunted by and consciously or unconsciously we are chasing this. We have many projects. We, 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 we chase it in many different ways. But that this, the dream of perfection is something that we all share. You may not call it perfection, you may call it a search for happiness, a search for truth, whatever. Whatever we are looking for in life. But it's there in all of us. And Vedanta says, it is true. What we are searching for, whatever we may call it, success, happiness, prosperity, whatever we may call it, it's not a, a, a false quest. It's not a fool's errand. There is something within us that, uh, that corresponds to this search. But the thing is, we are looking in the wrong place. The big problem is, as we come into this life and we look outwards, we search for that perfection, that central quest of our lives in the world around us. We search for it in money. The more we have, we think the happier we will be. We may say that, oh, I know money cannot buy happiness. We may say that, we have, but we have this uh, slight uh, feeling at the back of our minds that, well, if I were a millionaire or a billionaire, I would definitely be a little happier. That I don't question. So that kind of feeling is there at the back of our minds. I was reading the latest Oxfam report on the inequalities in wealth, and it says that it seems that six people, not six percent, Six people in the world have half the world's wealth. This latest report said last year it was 60 people. Now they're saying six people have half the world's wealth. It's incredible. They're saying that it's not enough to call it extreme inequality. They're calling it pathological inequality in the world. But then how much is enough? Billions and billions and still it's not enough. One wants to keep on accumulating. Obviously wealth is not where you find lasting, satisfying um, you know, satisfaction or peace. In possessions, gadgets, 
cars, houses, possessions. And yet there also, where is the end to it? We've got iPhone 6, now along, along comes iPhone 7. And I can guarantee there'll be iPhone 8 and 9 and 10 and so on and so forth. So there is no end to that either. And whoever has found satisfaction there, even if you're satisfied with it, Apple will make sure that you're not satisfied by bringing out another one which makes you feel bad about the one you've got. Um, not in possessions. People seek for real joy and happiness, especially in our world, in, in relationships. People think that there's an ideal of happiness, especially in this country, that there's romantic love which will give lasting happiness. And there are people think that it's, it's possible. And um, this morning I was coming by train to Penn Station to take the Amtrak to um, Washington. And there were, there were advertisements on the train. So there's this advertisement which said, it's interesting, it says, when diamonds are not forever, dash divorce court. <laughs> a, a, a divorce uh, lawyer. Relationships. The most go into it with tremendous expectation and often ends out disastrously, ends up disastrously. Where do you find happiness? Where do you find that lasting peace which seems to be the deep quest of our lives? It seems nowhere, but there is a class of people actually who have found this. In history, we see all throughout history, there are these saints and mystics of different religions who claim to have found something that gives them deep and lasting peace and happiness. They are the only ones who claim to have found this, this kind of um, solution, this, this end to the quest. Nobody else has. The thing is, we are looking in the wrong direction. The Bundaka Upanishad says, Paran chikhani vyatrinat swayam bhutasmat parang pasyati nantaratvan. The Lord has made our senses in his wisdom, has made our senses in such a way that all of it flows outwards. We see things out there, we hear things out there. So outwards, and we do not see what is within us. Vedanta, the central message of Vedanta is that what you are looking for all your life lies within you. In fact, it is you, your real nature. The essence of Vedanta can be stated in the so-called great sentences, profound sentences, Mahavakya. Tattvamasi, that thou art. Aham Brahmasmi, I am Brahman. I am Atma Brahma. This very self, this you, this person is Brahman, the infinite. Pragyanam Brahma, this individual consciousness here is actually the universal consciousness, pure consciousness. All of these, they mean the same thing. What we are looking for lies within us. We are looking in the wrong direction. It lies this way. This real self of ours, which is the goal of Vedanta, it's always there with us. All the time. And that, according to Vedanta, is a, is a real goal of religion. All religions, all spiritual paths lead back to what is already within us. I remember something funny. I mean, this, this quote, I used it once too often. This is a thing which I like very much. It says, um, what lies behind you and what yet lies ahead of you in life. That means what has already happened in your life and what's going to happen in the rest of the years of your life is as nothing compared to what lies within you. Right? It's such a beautiful way of expressing the non-dual truth, or Vedantic truth. What lies behind us in our lives and whatever will happen in, the life, in our lives years ahead is nothing, neither the good nor the bad, not, none of it compares with the infinity that lies within us. So I use this quote once too often and then I had to suffer the consequences uh, in Santa Barbara. So a devotee gave me a card uh, which says, and it exactly says the same thing on, on top of the card, what lies behind you and what lies ahead of you is as nothing compared to uh, what lies within you and dot dot dot, open the card. What lies inside the freezer? So in the freezer, <laughs> we went there and they had put ice cream in the freezer. <laughs> um, but this gives rise to a special problem. You see, if we say that the ultimate truth sought after by the mystics and saints of all religions, what they have found is already within us, it creates a special problem. 
If I say that there exists a God, if you say where? Oh, in heaven. That's all right then. Because if that ultimate reality is here and now, then the question will come that, why don't I experience it if it's here? If there is a God in heaven, I at least have an excuse. You don't experience God here because God is in heaven. I was uh, driving along in, um, in some place and there was a big billboard which says, heaven is a place. If heaven is a place, that's good in a way because then you can claim that, yes, heaven is real, you have to believe in it and you will go there. You don't experience it now because this is another place and that's heaven, that's another place and there's a third place for you if you're naughty. So these are different places. Since they are different places, it's no wonder that you do not experience them now because they're elsewhere. Something that is separated from you by distance, some other place. You have to go there to experience it. So there is a post-mortem kind of religion where it says that if you follow this, then you'll be rewarded or punished after you die, post-mortem. Then you go to the promised heaven or the threatened hell or whatever. And you can believe in it or choose to disbelieve in it. But the problem arises when you say Brahman, the, the infinite spiritual reality which Vedanta speaks of, he is everywhere, all the time. There is nothing that is different from Brahman. All space, all time and all objects are pervaded that by, by that Brahman which Vedanta speaks of. Then we are justified in asking this question. If Brahman is everywhere, then Brahman should be here right now. It should be here. Yes. If Brahman is eternal, then Brahman should be right now also. And if nothing is different from Brahman, then this table and you and the chair and this building, none of this should be different from Brahman. But why is it that I do not see Brahman, let alone everywhere, I do not see it anywhere. Let alone all the time, I do not see it any time. Let alone in all objects, the saints are supposed to see Brahman, God in everything. I don't see it in anything. What's the problem here then? If it's everywhere, all the time, in everything, why do I not experience it? I should be able to experience it. And Vedanta says, so you should. You should be able to experience it and you will. In fact, the way they explain it is, it's right here, right now, and not different from you. It's, it's your inner spiritual reality. The only thing that keeps us from experiencing that, from, making, from seeing it as a reality, is ignorance. It's here, but we do not see it. We do not see it. How is that possible? So, um, if I say that um, there is, uh, if, some, if you come and search, where is Eva here? And she's here, but you don't know who Eva is. And you look around and you say, where is Eva? And somebody points her out, that's her. And then you say, oh, okay, that's her. Now you've already seen her before this. But what happened now? Somebody supplied the information and you recognized, oh, that's Eva. Did you see somebody new or did you get new information about what, what you are already seeing? You got new information. You were introduced to something that you are already seeing. It's already there. The self that Vedanta speaks about that Brahman is our own inner self. If Brahman is our own inner self, I am right here. It should be right here. It is right here. What we need, we need is somebody to introduce us. Do that. That's Eva thing. That's Brahman. That's what Vedanta does. It introduces us to Brahman in our own experience. To do this, to introduce us to our own spiritual self, Brahman, there's a process. The whole idea is to remove ignorance about our own nature by knowledge about our own nature. Ignorance is removed by knowledge. Avidya is removed by vidya. Ajnana by jnana. But there is a condition here. They say in, uh, in Vedanta that knowledge can remove ignorance only when the object and locus of knowledge and ignorance are the same. And that sounds awfully technical, but it's actually very simple. Ashraya and Vishaya in Sanskrit, they should be the same. What does that mean? What you are ignorant about, 
what I am ignorant about, my knowledge should be about that. Which simply means if I am ignorant about German, it's no use learning Spanish. I need to learn German. If I'm ignorant about my own self, to remove that ignorance, I need to learn about my own self. And the knowledge and the ignorance should, come, should be in the same locus. Knowledge should come where there is ignorance. So my guru's knowledge will not help me. My guru may be enlightened, but that does not help me because the ignorance is not in the guru. Ignorance is here. So the knowledge should come here. The locus ashraya, the place of ignorance, and the object of ignorance, the knowledge should match that. Simple, actually. How do you do that? You are going to be introduced, here you are introduced to Eva. When they say you are going to be introduced to Brahman, but Brahman is you yourself, your true nature. So you are going to be introduced to yourself. You might say, I am here, what do I need introduction to? I need introduction to people I do not know. But Vedanta says, we do not know ourselves. Vivekananda in this country, I remember in one place in complete works, there is, in a place there's a reminiscence about Vivekananda by an American disciple. She says Vivekananda would sometimes look at us, Swamiji would look at us and say in a tone of pathos, if only you knew yourself as you truly are. If only you knew yourself as you truly are. That's what Vedanta is going to do. It's going to introduce us to ourselves. It's going to show the treasure hidden within. There's a beautiful song in Bengali which says that people of the world, they sit on the shores of an ocean of nectar and they are dying of thirst because they don't see it. They don't see it. They scrabble about in the sand trying to find sustenance and they cannot. They die of thirst. That's what we are doing in life. We are scrabbling around trying to get satisfaction. I remember this, um, this uh, Swami in the Himalayas. I used to go and study um, Ashtavakra Gita with him. A, a strict non-dualist Swami uh, in the tradition of Totapur. He was also Punjabi. I don't know if he's still al alive. Um, used to sit at his feet. I and some other monks, we would go and study. And um, I used the Ramakrishna Mission publication of Ashtavakra, which is a translation, Nitya Swarupanji, into English. And the monks there would, they looked at it and they were surprised. And they, in Hindi they said, Acha, Angreji mein Ashtavakra, dikhai ye, dikhai. You have an Ashtavakra Gita in English, let me see it. <laughs> he said to us that one day a television crew came to Gangotri and they wanted to. Uh, because the Swami had never seen television, they wanted to put up a show for him. So they put a TV set in front of him, they cranked up a generator, pointed the camera at the, at the river, and the Swami said, I saw everything, oh monks, I saw the river, and I saw, heard the gurgling sound of the river water. He says, I, everything is, I can see that. The river in front of me, in the, in the TV, in that box. He says, then I said to the, the, the film producer, the director, and he said, sir, can you give me a glass of Ganga water from there? <laughs> Babu, ek gilas Ganga pani diji. And uh, they laughed at him and they said, oh Swami, what are you saying? You can see it, but it's not there really. In Hindi, they said, dikta hai, lekin hai nahi isme kuch. You can see it, you can hear it, but it's not really there. And then that Swami, I can never forget that, you know, he turned up upon us with fierce intensity. And he said to us, pointing out the towering mountain peaks around us, you know, glaciers running down. It was summer, so there was no snow there, but it was up there in the towering peaks. There were the true Himalayan giants, 15, 20,000 feet around. Um, and the forests and the Ganga in, below us. And he says to us, O oh monks, all of this appears to you. There is nothing here. Ye sab dikhta hai. Isme saar kuch nahi hai. Literally, there is no substance here. What he means by substance is, there is no reality to this, what, what appears to you in the five, through the five senses. And there is no satisfaction in this. It will not satisfy your soul. It will not quest, uh, quench the thirst the, the eternal thirst that is within us. 
What we are thirsting for is not out there in the objects of the senses. In the rupa rasa gandha sparsa shabda. In the sounds, in the smells, in the touch, in the taste, uh, in the sights. In, in, it's not there. That substance is not there. Where is that substance? Vedanta says it's you. It's your inner reality. And the process that Vedanta takes us through says what you must do is to see yourself as you truly are. We reply, I know what I am. And Vedanta says, you do not know the truth about yourself. The truth about yourself will be revealed. If I do not know the truth about myself, and I want to know the truth about myself, the process is inquiry. In the world also, you know, the government sets up commissions, inquiry commission. What does the commission do? It's supposed to discover the truth. So we must set up a commission about ourselves. Vedanta is that commission about ourselves, which is, going to re which is going to reveal the truth about ourselves. So the central approach of Vedanta, of the Upanishads, I should clarify, I mean Advaita Vedanta, is the method of self-inquiry. It's an inquiry by ourselves into ourselves, with the help of Vedanta. There are different processes, very interesting methods, which are set out by Vedanta. This is the, the path of inquiry, which are amarga. I will, there are different processes. We all, all heard about them. The method of um, the three states of the mind, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. You inquire into that. Or the five levels of the, of, of the five, uh, I would say, layers of the human personality. The Annamaya Kosha, the food sheet, and the Pranamaya Kosha, the vital sheet, the Manomaya Kosha, the mental sheet. The uh, Vijnana Maya, the intellect sheet of the intellect, and the Ananda Maya, the bliss sheet, and investigate that. That's one way. That's another another process. And there's another process, this method of the seer and the seen, Drig Drishya Viveka. What I propose to do here this evening is, let's follow one of these processes just for a while, and see what we can discover. The idea is to get a taste of self-inquiry, the Vedantic self-inquiry. And maybe for a lucky few, you might walk out enlightened. <laughs> but at the very least, we get a, get a sense of how Vedanta approaches this problem. It's a very simple method. But you'll have to walk with me through this method. And it's a journey within yourself. It's a journey within ourselves. What are we going to do? Enquiry about the self, about you. I often, people say Vedanta is a dry and boring subject. I say it's the most interesting subject of all. Why? Because it talks about the, that which is dearest to you, you yourself. What's the subject which, which interests us the most? Ourselves, we. And Vedanta takes that up. There's another objection, that it is too difficult. It's too difficult. We are not qualified. Vedanta sets out a long list of qualifications for those who would walk on this path. You know, the, the razor's edge, Shurasya Yadhara, Viveka, Vairagya, Shamadamadi, Shat Sampatti, Mumukshuttam. If you listen to those qualifications, you feel like shutting the book and saying goodbye, thank you. <laughs> but I heard this very interesting quote of Ramana Maharshi, the great Advaitin, the sage of Arunachala. Somebody asked him, am I qualified for Advaitic inquiry? Am I qualified for that? Because Ramana Maharshi would prescribe that who am I inquiry. And he said, did you say I? I, the vertical I, I. Am I qualified? If you said I, you are qualified. You have got an I. And you can inquire, who am I? So that way we are all qualified, of course. Everybody is preeminently qualified. Let's take up one method, uh, one, one process, and see what, where it takes us. The process uh, I've selected is the simplest and one of the most direct and most powerful processes. Uh, it is the, the method of the seer and the seen, Drig Drishya Viveka. It's uh, one of my favorite approaches, I have, but I've did, done it so many times, people have sort of identified me with it. <laughs> but anyway, it's very simple and direct. Who am I? In every experience, I know that I am the subject of the experience. I am that which experiences. And everything else is 
an object of experience, I am experiencing it. So in every experience, I am the seer, and what I experience is the seen. Seer and seen. So whatever is the seer is me, and what is the seen is different from me. It's something very simple. When you are looking at this, you are different from this. Your eyes see this, and therefore your eyes are different from it. If it were not different, if it was not a different entity apart from your eyes, you wouldn't be able to see it. In fact, the only thing that our eyes cannot see are the eyes themselves. The limits of our vision are not out there as we would think. They are here. We, we, we do not see, see our own eyes. So, the seer and the seen must be two different entities. This is what we must hold on to. This is the operating principle with which we will work this evening. The seer and the seen must be two different entities. Now, the very first verse of this little book called Rig Rishya Viveka is a very powerful verse. It takes us to the entire process. It is, it's complete in itself. It will take you to, to that inner self which Vedanta speaks about. And the journey is completed in four stages. Stage one. And it's, it's very simple, step by step. And in fact, for the first two steps, you will just say, yes, go on, go on. We know all this. From the known to the unknown. Something that's very common. From there, in little baby steps. Till suddenly you say, wait, 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 wait. Back up, back up. What did you just say? First step, very simple. Rupam drishyam lochanam drik. The forms, rupam literally means color, but also you can extend it to whatever you see, the forms. Rupam drishyam, all the forms are the seen and the eyes are the seer. You may say, wait, wait, eyes are not the seer, I am seeing through the eyes. Don't even go there, baby steps, very naive, simple approach. Eyes are seeing and the world of forms is seen. And very clearly, the world of forms is different from the eyes. The eyes are something different, the world of forms is different. One. And also note, just by the way, the same pair of eyes sees myriad different forms. Thousands of forms. Since, since the morning till now, how many shapes and colors and things you have seen with the same pair of eyes? The seer is one, by which I don't mean that we are one-eyed, but the same organ of vision. The seer is one, the seen are many. Another thing, let's notice. The seer remaining the same, relatively speaking. The seen keep changing. Imagine how it has changed since the morning. You woke up and saw something, then you came out, you went to work, and then you came here, you're seeing something now, After, afterwards you'll see something else. What you see continuously keeps changing. That which sees, it's the same eyes. The same eyes, remaining the same, more or less, they keep seeing different things. The seer and the seen are different. The seer is one, the seen are many. The seer is relatively unchanging, and the seen keep changing. These things will become important later on. That's stage one. And at each stage, you should, you should do one thing. You should note that it's a fact. Is it not a fact that you are seeing this with your eyes? It's a fact. Take it in a very simple way. It's a fact, yes. Each stage you should see it's a fact, not theory. Not something to be realized by the grace of God. That you are seeing this with your eyes is something to be realized by the grace of God. No, it's a fact. You're impatient. Go on. We know this. Second stage. Tadrishyam driktu manasam. The eyes themselves are objects of our experience. My eyes are open. I can't keep my eyes open. He's boring me so much. I need glasses or I can see perfectly well. What is happening with my eyes? I know. How do I know? With my mind. I can think about it. I understand. Not only the eyes, ears, and the whole body in fact. I understand everything about my eyes and the rest of this biological system with my mind. So the eyes and the rest of this is the seen and the mind is the seer. Eyes are the seen and the mind is the seer. Seer and seen are different. They're two different entities. And here again, is it a fact? True, yes. The mind, whatever it is, is clearly different from the eyes. The eyes are right here and there's a clear biological system which can be described, which is, seems to be quite different from the mind which is experiencing the eyes. So the seer and the seen are different. Not only that, 
the various sensory systems, the eyes, ears, and all that, all of them are experienced by one common mind, the internal organ, antakkarana, which experiences all the different sensory systems. Not only that, they're all changing. At one time I could see perfectly well 20-20 vision, now I need glasses. Who understood that? The same mind. So the different conditions of the body and sensory system are understood by the same mind. Is it a fact? Yes. Note that it's a fact, that it's a fact of your life. You don't need Vedanta to understand this. The next stage, the third stage, is where things get interesting. We are doing self-inquiry. We are going deeper and deeper to find you. How will we find you? In this process, you are the seer, the real seer. The eyes which were the seer for the world have now themselves become the scene and the mind is the seer. And what about the world? Still the scene. Mind through the eyes sees the world. The mind sees the eyes. Sees the eyes means experiences, understands, knows the conditions of the eyes. Simple. The mind itself. Drishya dhivrittaya sakshi. The third stage. The conditions of the mind, thoughts, feelings, emotions, perceptions, memories, all these are experienced. That I am sad or I am happy. I know this. Who else would know it if I don't? I understand what he is saying. I do not understand what he is saying. The intellect, the functioning of the intellect. I clearly experience it. We have all had the experience of struggling with a math problem which we cannot crack. In a, you know, in school days, I don't get it. I'm not getting it. And then we crack it. And then we, under, we feel, oh, I got it right now. See, from the intellect shifted from not understanding to understanding. And clearly I experienced it. That school child experienced it. The shift in the intellect. And I cannot remember something. I'm trying to recall. Then I recall it. That state of not recalling and then recalling, both I experienced. So memory, intellect, emotions, perceptions, all the stuff that is in the mind, all of it is experienced. What or who is experiencing the mind? That which experiences the mind, you cannot deny that the contents of our minds are experienced. If they are experienced, the mind itself becomes the scene. And there must be a seer of the mind. Right? Let, let's call that the seer of the mind the witness, because it witnesses the changing mind. It calls it the sakshi. And remember, the witness, the seer of the mind and the mind must be different. Yes, they cannot be the same, because seer and the seen are two different entities. And there will be questions, isn't it the mind observing the mind? And I'll let you work out those questions. If you cannot, you ask me, I'll, I'll give you clear instances where you can see clearly it's not the mind. Something else apart from the mind. Of course, Vedanta is going to say it is consciousness, pure consciousness, which illumines the contents, the movements of the mind. Sakshi, that must be separate. The seer must be separate from the mind. Not only that, all the contents of the mind, all the thoughts, feelings, emotions, memories that we have had throughout the day and throughout our lives have been illumined by that one witness. And the mind continuously changes throughout the day. So many thoughts, feelings come up. It's the unchanging witness which witnesses the changing contents of the mind. So one seer illumining the mind, unchanging, and the many contents of the mind, they become the scene. Seer and scene are different. Here we come to something interesting. You are not the mind. You are the witness of the mind. This is something that most of us, we, we do not think that way. We mostly mature, educated, adult people, we, we identify ourselves with our minds. We feel we are this person inside a body. We sometimes, we say I am the body or it's my body sometimes. But we always, we generally, we identify ourselves with our minds. That's what we call our personality. That's what we call our me, my I. This is me. It contains our little biological tale, my, the story of my life. That's all part of the mind, memory. This is who I am. This is what we, we think. That's, that's my personality. But Vedanta says, it cannot be you. Why? Because you are always the seer. In every experience, you must be the experiencer. 
And the mind is something that is experienced. Clearly you cannot be the mind. You must be something apart from the mind. You don't feel the mind is experiencing you. You experience the thoughts. Then the whole human personality. You see, it's very interesting. The word personality I discovered comes from the Greek personae. Which means a mask. You see, it seems in ancient Greece, in theatres, there was no sound system there. So the players, the, the actors had to go out into the amphitheatre and hold up big masks about their role, which, whichever role they're playing, and then recite the lines and then come back, change the mask and take it out and hold it there and recite the lines. Those masks were called personae. In fact, the word personality has come from that. It literally means a mask. It's not who you are. You are not the person you think you. You are not even a person. You are the consciousness, unchanging, pure consciousness, shining upon this person, the little person, and enabling the person to exist and function. That's the radical conclusion that Vedanta gives. Not so radical, actually. I've been looking at different... Um, problems and discussions which are coming up in consciousness studies and they are having a big problem dealing with what is called the hard problem of consciousness that how is it possible for a completely physical system this body is a physical system and what lies within it is also a physical system how is it possible for a material physical system like this to generate a subjective first person experience you see when you look at this what we can find from outside, a scientist can find, is some neurons firing in your brain. That much they can find. But your experience is not of neurons firing in your brain. You experience a piece of paper shining in the light here. You experience the color pink here. That's what you experience. You don't see brain, neurons firing in the brain. Externally one thing, internally there is a first person experience. I often give the example of, in California we have this Google car. A car which drives itself. There are computers which drive it. There's a lot of discussion going on about that. So when you're driving along and this Google car pulls along next to you and you look, there's nobody in the driver's seat. There is actually, nowadays there is, but that guy is not driving. He keeps his hands off from the steering. So when you are driving, there is such a thing as a feeling of driving. There are sights, sounds, decisions to be made continuously. You are experiencing all of that in real time. A vivid inner movie. Yeah, in, in multiple dimensions, sound, sight, uh, smell, touch, a feel, thoughts. None of that is there in the Google car. Even Google's best computer engineers would never dare claim that the computer is having a first person inner life. No, they don't. But externally, that car does exactly what you are doing. And maybe better. They claim it drives a car better than a human driver. This difference Consciousness studies has no handle on it. How do you explain it? That is what, we see, that is the inner experience, the witness within our minds. Through the mind, sense organs. Through the mind and the sense organs, the body experiences the world. That is what we really are. Now the question will come, can I not experience that, that witness then? Here, let me tell you one thing. I said that every stage, Check to see whether it's a fact. Your eyes are the seer, this is the scene. Is it a fact or not? Most people will say, yes, it's a fact. They will nod their heads. Mind is the seer, eyes and the rest of the body is the scene. Is it a fact or not? Do, can I know my body? Yes, I can. Mind is the scene. You are the witness of the mind. Most people at this point would say, that might be so, but I have to do a lot of sadhana to realize that. Vedanta at this point says, it's as much a fact right now as this eyes seeing this piece of paper. It's a fact right now. And the struggle is to recognize a fact as a fact. We are so tied up with the mind and through the mind the body. Once you get tied up with the mind, you are tied to the body also. Sukshma Sharira, Sthula Sharira. They are closely linked. That it's very difficult for us to metaphorically step back and see the mind as an object like this. That's why the fourth stage says, Drigevanatu Drishyate. The seer, the witness, never becomes an object of experience. Can we never know it then? You cannot know it as an object. If the whole idea of self-inquiry was to know the self, now are you saying that we cannot know the self? 
Should I not have taken the trouble to drive up here to the Vedanta Society this evening? No. In fact, what it says is you cannot know the self as an object, but you do know it as yourself. You are it. There is a way of knowing as an object and a way of knowing as, with, as being. You know, the difference between if a doctor examines the contents of the stomach and with this enzyme and these secretions and comes to the conclusion finally after looking after all the reports, this person is hungry. And the person can say, yeah, I know, I'm, I feel it, I'm hungry. That's a subjective report of an objective finding, you know. So internally, that, that's another way of knowing by being something. You are this consciousness. You shining, everything else shines. Tameva bhantam anubhati sarvam. You, that consciousness shining, your mind shines, irradiated with that consciousness which you are. Your mind shining, the sense organs light up. Sense organs shining, the world is revealed to you. You use and you use this body to interact with the world. And yet, you are not the body no more than you are the car which you drive. You are not even the mind no more than the, you are the computer which you use. You can compare the mind to an app or a series of apps, set of apps which you deploy. You are not it. It's a tremendous, if you, once we begin to get a hint of what they are saying, the first experience is of great relief and freedom. We are free of it. I exist when the mind, mind is thinking and I also exist when the mind is not thinking. I am the same all throughout. The mind changes, the body is mortal. That witness consciousness is unchanging, immortal. This is the conclusion of Vedanta. Not only is that, th that shining, everything else shines. And this is, Tasya Bhasa Sarvam Idam Vibhati. By its light, is, everything is lit up here. Do you know, every day we sing, you know, we, in, the, in the evening prayers, we sing to Sri Ramakrishna. Often we sing along, I'm being devotional. That's not Vedanta. What are you singing? Have you noticed? Jyoti Ra Jyoti Ujala Ridikandar. The light of lights shining in the cave. It's a cave of the heart. Shankaracharya says, cave of the heart is Buddhi Guha. It's the cave of the intellect. That consciousness which Drigdrishya Viveka speaks about, the Sakshi, the witness of the mind right now, your real nature, is exactly what you are singing here looking at Sri Ramakrishna. Jyoti Ra Jyoti. Just today in the morning in the center in, in New York, we were chanting early morning prayers. We were chanting um, Buddhescha Sakshi Nikhilasya Janto Yo Veti Sakalam Nachayasya Veta. The witness of the Buddhi of all beings. Buddhescha Sakshi Nikhilasya Janto. Of all sentient beings, there is a conscious witness which is common to all beings. Yo Veti Sakalam, which. which Illumines and knows everything. Nachayasya For which there is no other knower. Because you cannot know, make the knower an object. And we are, we are chanting, I bow down to Ramakrishna, who is in this form. We think it's something very devotional, something out there. It's you are bowing down to your own ne real nature. Exactly what you really are. When we do not grasp it directly, we make it uh, into a god to be worshipped. That's the next best thing we can do. So, Vedanta says, it's in this consciousness that the world shines. As we think about it, this is only the first the opening uh, movement in a very grand uh, um, symphony. The next step is even more grand. As we think of this again and again, we identify ourselves more and more with the witness consciousness, unchanging witness of the mind and body then a remarkable thing begins to happen, something new. You begin to see that the world, the body and the mind are things which arise and exist and disappear in that consciousness, in that ocean of consciousness which you are. These are like waves which arise. It's not like light and an object. There is a light and here is object. Light comes and illumines the object. So is, is my consciousness like that? I am consciousness and I illumine these objects? No, not like that. You begin to feel all the objects are actually in consciousness. 
It's not that consciousness comes and illumines an object. It's rather all this, whatever is the scene, the universe, the body and the mind are in consciousness. They are not different from consciousness, no more than the waves in the Atlantic Ocean are different from the ocean. It's not that there is an ocean, there's, a, there's water and there is a wave. Oh no, you cannot show me the wa wave after, apart from the water. In the same way, all that is experienced in consciousness is not different from consciousness. We begin to get the intuition of that. And Vedanta says, you are intuiting correctly. I am Atma Brahma. This very consciousness which you experience as your inner witness is none other than Brahman, the ground of the universe. The whole universe is kalpita, is imagined, is an appearance in this ocean of Brahman, which you are. That's the meaning of tattvam asi. I could go on, but there are, I, I'm sure there will be questions in your mind. Um, if you have any questions at this point, do you? One Yes, there's a question there. We have got, I think, five or ten minutes for the questions. Talk about an aspect which connected me. We started working our mind. Yes. The other uh, term that people use is mindfulness. Yes. We try to pay attention to how you're thinking and how you're acting, what your actions are, how you react to it. Yes. It seems to be very difficult to separate self-respect and self-ego on a daily basis. Okay, I'll answer in the context of what I've been saying so far. Here is something interesting. When you have mindfulness, another name for that would be a kind of introspection. When you look and watch, not just the mind, you'll start off with something simple like the breath. You're breathing in and you note that you're breathing in. You're breathing out, you note that. It's a, it's a vipassana practice in Buddhism. And from there you go a little more deeper into the sensations which are arising in the body anchoring yourself in the breath. Then you go deeper into the thoughts and emotions which are arising in the mind. That's subtlest. And you are aware of that and you note what is arising. In you know what's the difference between this and the Vedantic approach which I just said? The difference is this. There you are aware of what is arising, what exists in the mind, in your, in your awareness and what subsides again. That's all you are aware of and you are mindful. What Vedanta says precisely at that point is what is aware of all of this? Vedanta, in, in that meditation you are interested in the contents which arise and subside in your awareness. Vedanta is interested in the awareness itself. Right? What am I thinking of now? What's in my mind now? Mindfulness. What is aware of the contents of my mind now? Vedanta. Okay? Now to answer your specific question, how do I distinguish between what's, for example, self-respect and ego? Am I being egotistic or am I protecting my self-respect? From the highest standpoint, from the Vedantic standpoint, I am not the ego. That's the first thing we must understand. That's, that's the central point. Why am I so worried and concerned about the ego is because I think I am the ego. Who am I? I. The word I, that's who I am. But the ego is just a function of the mind. Abhiman Atmika Vritti uh, Ahankara, that is Abhiman Atmika, which appropriates to itself all other functions of the mind and body. I am speaking. Speaking is happening in the body with the help of the mind. And what does the ego do? I am speaking. You say, I am listening. Listening is happening there. And what does the ego do? I am listening. It appropriates to itself. It steals something that does not belong to itself. You are not even the ego. Did you notice what I said? The little personality is a mask. What does the ego identify itself with? With the mind, with the body, with the story of your life. That's what the ego says it is. All of that is witnessed by the unchanging consciousness which you truly are. The moment we do that, we take a step back from the ego. Then the ego becomes an object like this. You're no longer afraid, you're no longer overprotective about the ego. The ego becomes much weaker. It relaxes its hold. Have you noticed we all sing Chidananda Rupa Shivo Ham Shivo I am bliss, I am consciousness, I am the nature of Shiva. But 
Do you know the first line which you sing? Mano vudyahankara chittani naham. I am not the mind, I am not the intellect, I am not the memory. I am not the ahankara. What a, what a co apparently contradictory thing to say. I am not the I. Ahankara means I, ego. I am not I. What does it mean? Isn't it self-contradictory? It's not. You are the witness of the I. When you know, it, know yourself that way, the ego loosens its hold upon you. Then you can actually judge whether I am being egotistic or is it genuine self-respect. Right? And you can afford to be humble without any fear. Truly saintly people, they are the, they are the most humble of people. Um, uh, they, 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 are the mo they are the greatest amount of real humility. With, without any kind of sense of inferiority. Very relaxed, very sweet, uh, full of humility. Because they do not, that little person is not the whole identity. They are one with the entire universe, or the entire universe is one with them. Question. Yes. So I think you're talking about the existence part of the Brahman. Yes. And then you say you are witnessing it. Yes. Because you are talking about the consciousness part of the Brahman. Yes. How about the bliss part? Right. Now, look at the language. It's not a part. I'll just make a, make a point there. What it is in itself is very difficult to say. It's beyond language. But it is definitely the very existence of all things that exist. The existence itself is called Sat. That's the existence aspect of it, of Brahman. Because existence, Sat is not a part of Brahman. It's not like uh, this table has got parts. So there's one part called Sat, another part called Chit, another part called Ananda. It itself is Sat, it itself is Chit, it itself is Ananda. All things that exist borrow their existence from Brahman. And therefore, because nothing could exist without Brahman. I mean, literally, logically speaking, what can exist without existence? Nothing can. So, Brahman is called existence, existence absolute. Swami Vivekananda said, not that it exists, it is existence itself. Now, as you rightly pointed out, you notice that aspect in everything in the world. After all, what is has to have existence. And you notice another aspect in yourself. Not only do you exist, not only do inside when we look at ourselves, not only do I exist, but this existence within me shines. That is Chaitanya, uh, consciousness. In every experience that we have, it, uh, it borrows con the mind borrows consciousness from Brahman, from the Atman, and enables that experience. That shining, everything. When you say shining, the consciousness aspect comes in. And in every joy and happiness and uh, meaning and value in life that we have, and that we chase, that we want to possess, all of that, they bought that, that joy, that value, that meaning, that bliss is borrowed from the ananda aspect of Brahman. One way of, um, of explaining this is, one, ex one way I've come across is that everything borrows existence from Brahman, from Sat. Every thought, experience, thoughts, feelings, emotions, only in the mind do we find the appearance of the consciousness aspect of Brahman. <clears throat> Only in the mind. Which mind? Your mind. Right? You say, why? In all minds here. But you do not experience the consciousness in all beings. All you experience here are the bodies. If you are a telepath, you would experience their minds. But the consciousness in all beings never becomes an object for your experience. So, consciousness is experienced by us only in our minds. And... In the sattvic mind, happiness is experienced, bliss is experienced. So, this is another way, the bliss aspect manifests in the sattvic mind. Now you have any name and form manifests the existence aspect, sat. Only a subset of these names and forms called the minds, antakkarana, subtle body, manifests the chit aspect of Brahman. And a further subset of the mind, when the mind is in sattvic state, it manifests the ananda aspect of Brahman. Ananda itself, you cannot have ananda without chit and sat. You cannot have chit without sat. Right? So, anand, sat, chit, ananda are the same thing, but depending on what medium you are experiencing it in, you can have only the experience of sat, borrowed sat, 
or the experience of Sat and Chit or the experience of Sat, Chit, Ananda. That's one way I found of, um, of uh, explaining this. Yes. Uh oh. <laughs> yes. 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 Now, so he's asking is then what is the relevance of the Shakti? In Advaita Vedanta, they are very um, minimalistic. The first thing that we learn about Advaita Vedanta in our textbook, uh, Vedanta Sara. One line which we memorize, the whole takeaway from that book is one sentence. Vastu Satchidananda Madhvayam Brahma Agyanadi Sakala Jada Samuha Avastu. The reality is only Satchid Ananda non dual Brahman. Starting from Agyana, which is, uh, which is the word they use for Maya, Shakti, and all of that. Starting from that, and all of its products are not real in themselves, they borrow reality from Brahman. So in non dual Vedanta, Shakti or Maya in itself is, uh, is something that depends on Brahman for its existence and manifestation. And yet, you cannot deny it. If you have to explain why that absolute existence, bliss and consciousness absolute manifests in all these forms, you cannot explain it in itself. So, something is there which leads to this kind of manifestation. When you give stress on that something, then Shakti becomes important. Then, the, uh, then Advaita goes into Shakta Advaita, into, say, for example, Kashmir Shaivism, uh, all the other nearly non-dualistic philosophies, I would say. They're all classified as non-dualistic, but uh, they are not exactly the same as Shankara Advaita. So there, more and more importance is given to the Shakti, the manifestation aspect. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, there is, I think three thoughts are two thoughts. Um, the witness, is it the consciousness or it is the consciousness illumined by the Brahman which is the present in everything? That is the first thought. And second, um, is it Brahman, uh, the consciousness which is illumined in us? That is, we see the consciousness that is not different from the consciousness of all the other things we see outside. Yes. So this is in the irrespective of the forms, name and forms and everything. Yes. And um, how do we really, because the karmic action, the interaction, the relationships, they are all, are they manipulated by this uh, uh, extent of consciousness or they are not affected, it is only our uh, maya, it puts the relation. Well, okay. <laughs> They're all big questions. They all deserve a separate class each. Yes, but ask, please do ask. No, that the application is, you know, I think with uh, Vedanta or your lectures or maybe, you know, other part of self-inquiry, everything, having got the knowledge, like wants to realize, we are not this body, we are not this mind, we are something else, which is universal, hmm. which is exist in the stone, tree, everything. Having got the knowledge, how is it we can be guided by that in every day, our action, our life? I think that is the most important question, yes. Um, first of all, the question about consciousness, the part one of the question. One way is not to get caught up in terms. Because what I'm calling consciousness is, if you read some of the other Neo-Vedanta teachers, for example, Nisargadatta uses a completely different terminology. So he uses awareness for what I'm calling consciousness. The Sanskrit terms are more precise. Chaitanyam, Sat, Chit, Ananda, Sat. I'll give you one way of um, a very clear approach. Vedanta always sticks closely to, cleaves closely to our experience. In experience, in your experience right now, if you want to trace yourself back to the pure consciousness, which is your real nature, which is you actually, there's a definition, there's a definition which goes like this. What is Chaitanyam, pure consciousness? Anidam Chaitanyam, not this consciousness. In our experience, whatever you can say this, 
This table, this body, this breath, this thought, none of that is you. None of that is consciousness. That's an object of consciousness. This thought, this Vedantic idea of Sakshi, also this. Right? When you use this, this definition, which is also something in the, in the buddhi itself, use it to step back and back, back towards yourself. That points you towards pure consciousness. You can use any term. You can call it pure consciousness, the pure subject, Atman, Purusha, whatever you want to call it. That's the answer to the first part of your question. And this consciousness is common to everything. Uh, you see, common to everything also. When you say pure consciousness is all-pervading, actually what you are doing is you are bringing in the concept of space. And from the point of view of space you are saying pure consciousness is all-pervading. Even space is something that is imagined in consciousness. So in one sense, is pure consciousness all-pervading from the point of view of space? Yes. When you say pure consciousness is eternal, again you're bringing in the concept of time. And then you're saying that pure consciousness is eternal. And when you say pure consciousness is in everything, you're bringing in the concept of everything. Right? And it's there for, for everything. So in Sanskrit, it's more precise. Desha Kala Vastu. The moment you bring in desha, you have to say pure consciousness, chaitanya is sarvavyapi. When you bring in time, kala, you have to say pure consciousness is nityam. And when you bring in vastu, objects, people, things, the universe, you have to say pure consciousness is not different from the other, it's, it's common to everything. But in itself, pure consciousness is beyond being all pervasive, eternal or even being common to everything. This pure consciousness being in everything in Gita, it's there, 13th chapter. Kshetragyam chapi mam vidhi sarva kshetreshu bharata. Krishna says to Arjuna, know me alone to be the knower in all beings, in everybody. That which says I, which knows, which mistakes itself to be an individual sentient being, is in reality me, not different from God. In that sense alone, aham brahmasmi. Our real nature is Brahman in that sense alone. The third question is the most important. Um, it's Vivekananda clearly put it. Each soul is potentially divine and the goal of religion is to manifest this divinity. You know, I always thought, why did he not say to know this divinity? It's not enough to know it. It should be manifested. And he says, Vivekananda says, my goal in life can be put in a few words. Mission in life can be put in a few words. To preach unto mankind their inner divinity and how to make it manifest in every movement of life, in our thoughts, in our speech, in our day-to-day -day actions, in our living. How can this light shine through, this, uh, through, through life? That's a great teaching of the Ramakrishna Vivekananda tradition. Not just to keep it there. If we, one has a strong conviction, if one has a strong insight, it will manifest. But if you make a deliberate attempt to manifest it, then uh, it becomes more effective. Our lives become blessed. It, can be, it has to be worked out at the level of thought, at the level of understanding, at the level of feeling. Oneness. I am one with everybody. You and I and all of us are actually one reality. Literally, absolutely, in a, in a literal sense. How will that affect our ethics? How will that affect our behavior towards others? Tremendous effect will be there. Has to be there. Yes. Yes. Number one is you very nicely presented the fact that you know the logical sequences like hear and see and then you walk back. Yes. From intellect even, yes. 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 Yes.
All right. So, so uh, yes. Right, right. Um, okay. These are the two questions. These are the last questions because we are, and Sri Ramakrishna said, Kali Pete Dharma Haina. So, <laughs> consciousness is becoming weaker now without in the lack of food. <laughs> but let me take the last one first. The question about practice. Many people ask, oh, it's wonderful. I get what you're talking about, Swami. But now what do I do? That is where the entirety of sadhana comes in. You see, because directly to do that, it's so enormously difficult. When you actually seriously try to even grasp what it is, it becomes very difficult. That's why the enormous range of sadhana start with the most external. Our behavior, our actions convert karma into karma yoga. You see, when you're trying to detach yourself from this little personality, all work now should be done for something greater than this little personality. You can relate all the sadhana back to Advaita. You can see how it works. Bhakti yoga, of the nature of I want the world. Divert this I want towards God. I want God. Same I want. Bhakti yoga. Raja yoga. All this theory seems theoretical because the mind cannot absorb it. In one place in the gospel, Advaita is being discussed. And Sri Ramakrishna listens carefully and he makes one comment. The words are good. It should be assimilated. It cannot be assimilated because the mind is not ready to assimilate it. Deep meditation, consistent meditation, complete calmness of the mind is required to get that clarity. What we require is more than understanding the clarity. We have understood. We are not, it's not that we have not understood. It should become a real thing for us. That's why I said, can I give a tick mark? It's a fact. That much clarity should come. So sadhana, all these sadhanas are the great aids towards this clarity. Now your first question was, how can the mind, the intellect, which is an inferior entity, reveal the Atman which is superior? The answer is it cannot. Then you say, what are you doing then, all this time? What we were doing is knowledge, which is a function of the intellect. Removing ignorance, which is in the intellect. Remember how I started? Locus and object of ignorance and knowledge must be the same. Where is ignorance? Is it in the body? No. Is it in Atman or Brahman? No. Ignorance is in the individual intellect. Where is knowledge required? Not in Atman. It is required in the intellect. In the mind. In this psychophysical being, we must manifest that knowledge. That removes the ignorance. In fact, Shankaracharya says at one point, you do not need sadhana, knowledge and all that to become Brahman. You are that already. All you need it is to remove ignorance. Every kind of spiritual practice, including the highest Advaita, removes ignorance only. It removes... Wind cannot take you to the moon. The wind can only blow away the clouds. The wind is here in the atmosphere. The clouds are here in the atmosphere. The wind removes the clouds. The moon is always shining. That's what knowledge does to us. It's not that intellect reveals the uh, Atman. Rather, the Atman reveals the intellect. That's why again and again it is said, the intellect cannot grasp the Atman. The clarity comes. The intellect becomes an object to the Atman. That comes. We are not trying to grasp the Atman. They say in Advaita Vedanta, never try to understand yourself as Brahman. You cannot. Try to see rather that I am not the body, not the mind. What I think of myself as, that I am not, that clarity should come. Automatically you will realize there is something separate from this. Okay, good questions. Very good, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So now that Swamiji is not so far from us, New York, we hope that he'll come every once in a while. He's very busy, of course. Now he has a big center to run by himself, but still not so big. Not so big but in, 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 in any event, we hope that, Maharaj, that you'll come back whenever you can. It's really a great joy to listen to you. Thank you so much. Everyone, please join us in the basement now for dinner. <laughs>